So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our topic number one on prescription analysis, part one. And that will be tackling about uh, our geriatric patient for part one. Part two will be more into pediatric patient uh, and also our lactating and pregnant women. And also part number three will be tackling about extemporaneous uh, compounding medications. So for those who didn't know me, I'm Dr. Irwin martinez Falier. I'm your professor in pharmacy department, San Pedro College, and a visiting professor in Bournemouth University, United Kingdom. So for today, this will be our learning objective. One would be to interpret and analyze various prescriptions and medication order, and to design and analyze appropriate dosing schedules to identify extemporaneous compounded drug that will be in our part number three, and to determine appropriate dosage regimen, uh, which are appropriate for the medication order. And lastly, to plan and integrate prescriptions requiring special instruction. So that will be part and parcel then later for our part number three and part number two. So as we all know in the prescription analysis or prescription assessment, we be able to identify that in different hospitals and communities, there are a lot of prescription errors. And one of the very common prescription errors that we have is actually eligible prescription, meaning that in eligible prescription, they always write it by hand or handwritten. And of course, sometimes you don't know if that is the if it is a handwritten of a rooster or a handwritten, handwritten by a pig or an animal then. No? So we don't know what is it, right? Sometimes we misinterpret oftenly when we do dispensing or interpreted by the nurses. Sometimes there are uh, misinterpretation that happen. Aside from that, that are common are prescription with duplicate item, meaning they are the same in terms of indications of the use, but they are being given twice or double to our certain patient. Aside from that, to be wrong transcriptions or interpretation or misinformation then. Aside from that, would be uh, wrong frequency, unspecified in terms of allergy. No, we didn't even ask our patient what is the allergy of a particular patient then. At the same time also, in terms of drug without a dose, dose higher than recommended for a certain pediatric patient or a geriatric patient. And aside from that, would be wrong dose, wrong drug, wrong indication for a wrong disease. Sometimes would be one of the type of errors, prescription errors that had been uh, into the hospital or in the community setting. Now, these are really common, but it is uncommon to all of us once we educate our prescriber or our pharmacist then that this is really need to be avoided in terms of prescription errors that are already common in the hospital or in the community setting. So we need to avoid all of this and we need to educate and re-educate our healthcare providers for these common mistakes. Now, what would be the benefit then if we are looking into the prescription assessment or prescription analysis then? And one of the very common uh, benefit that we have in prescription analysis is to improve patient safety. Because as we all know, as pharmacists, we are very particular with drug-related problems. And these drug-related problems that oftenly experienced by our patient are common mistakes that us pharmacists or doctors or other healthcare professionals actually been, you know, given or done by our healthcare providers. So it is, we are the ones who safeguard in terms of patient safety, okay? Because before dispensing to our client, we be able to educate, we be able to identify then errors in the prescription. Number two is all about to appraise if they have 
identified certain errors. We don't actually condemn doctors or any other healthcare professional in terms of their mistakes. But then, we educate them and re-educate them in terms of the importance of prescription error-free environment. Okay? And dispensing error-free environment. At the same time also, it actually reduces unnecessary prescription that will be equivalent then in terms of efficient therapeutic agent, at the same time reducing such costs to our client. At the same time, reducing polypharmacy, especially for our geriatric and pediatric patients. So it's quite very important to say that it really improved the patient safety, patient care, the management, and reducing non-compliance or non-adherence of medication of our client. At the same time, it avoids wastage of money, resources, at the same time also wastage in terms of uh, the time of our client and also reducing the length of stay of our patient in a certain hospital, okay? So that is really the benefit then according to different journals and publication that was mentioned. And oftenly in terms of dispensing error, we always try to have a commonalities in terms of different errors. And one of the error that we always look into is our uh, misinterpretation of our abbreviations, sometimes unfamiliarity of our abbreviations of the prescription or unfamiliarity of abbreviation will sometimes result into dispensing errors. At the same time also, like you as supposed to be units, but it may result into a zero that may cause tenfold increase in the dose, okay? And sometimes also trailing zero, like for example, 1.0 milligram will may be mistaken as 10 milligram. So it's very different then. And the dose is quite extreme when we compare 1.0 to a 10 milligram dose. Now, there are some which may adopt with naked decimal point. When I was... Uh, you know, having researchers in government hospitals, sometimes they put it 0.5 milligram, which is oftentimes neglected the zero in the 0 0.5 milligram, which is it should be stated that it should be 0 0.5 rather than 0 0.5 milligram. Okay, that is often the mistake. And one of the very common dispensing error is the salads. What are salads? These are sound alike, look alike medication, meaning they may have same appearance, same color, same name, same sound, but may be different in terms of indication, may be different in terms of the use and all. So we need really to take note of that. And one of the examples that was actually stated there is the AZT Sidovodine, okay, which is actually your antiretroviral agent that was mistaken as azathioprine or azathioprinam, okay, which are actually quite different. Now, when we analyze certain prescription, we be able to have different steps. And I'm sure you are familiar with this for those who are with me last semester on dispensing number one. I always emphasize these three main steps. And one of the steps here is actually the step to identify the legality of the prescription. If it is, RA, uh, if it is based on RA10918, our new pharmacy law, or the Generics Act of 1988, or perhaps also in our Dangerous Drug Act. So basically, it's all about the legality. And what are under the legality? It is actually based on the name of our patient, the gender or the age, uh, the, the age you know, for the sex, the age, the date, 
and of course the signature the stamp or the signature of your uh, of your doctor or prescriber the PTR number the professional tax receipt or PTR and the professional regulation commission or PRC number of a certain uh, a certain prescriber for a dangerous drug we may actually have the uh, is either the S license for dangerous drug holder okay so it's very important that as a pharmacist and as a, a medical doctor, they have a license to actually prescribe and dispense in terms of dangerous drugs. So these are basing on the legality. Now, step number two is all about in terms of the clinical features or the clinical aspect then. So what are under clinical aspect? That is the name of a drug, the frequency, the route of administration, the indication, the drug interaction, the side effects and contraindication of a certain drug. And it may ha have also computations that are needed for a pediatric dose or a geriatric patient, depending upon the body weight of the patient or perhaps the renal clearance of a certain geriatric patient who have a problem of kidney clearance, a kidney, um, you know, may have kidney failure or may have other problems like the liver or other organs. So we'll be able to look at also the clinical aspects of a certain patient. So what is then the importance of this legal aspect and clinical aspect? So as we all know that if that to be looking at the age as a legality of a certain patient, it may also have clinical aspect. Like if that would be a pediatric patient, so once you actually dispense that is for adult dose, it may have actually a great impact then to a pediatric patient because it may cause a lot of damages to the organs of a pediatric patient. Like for example, if our patient is like it indicates an age which is two, two, meaning it is maybe two months or two years. That is why we need really to identify if it is two years or two months because two years is very different than in terms of a dose for a two months, uh, two months baby. Okay, so it really need to have a lot of things to consider when you're going to have the clinical aspect at the same time also the legal aspect. Now, for us, for the pharmacists and other healthcare provider, the main differences between us and other healthcare providers, especially with pharmacy aid and, of course, other healthcare professional, is our arts and science of practice of pharmacy. Why? Because we'll be able to have a, a particular skill in terms of interviewing patients for medical history, meaning that the patient will be able to be interviewed by a pharmacist if the patient have allergy to a certain medication, if the patient is taking with the drugs uh, oftenly, or is it a maintenance dose, or is it an initial dose then, or if the patient is having allergic reaction previously with the medication, or perhaps the patient may have uh, a lot of contraindication then, no? or bowel in terms of this particular drug. Or perhaps this drug may have drug, drug interaction, drug food interaction, or drug herbal interaction. So for short, really it is important that we be able to interview our client, our patient of the previous medical history and previous uh, medical history or medication history of a certain client. So it's important also like, for example, if that, uh, that would be uh, 20 years old and above, except if that would be old patient then, we'd be able to ask if the patient is pregnant. You don't ask a, 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 a guy 
or a certain male if he or he is actually pregnant or lactating? No. Okay? We'll be able to ask women in terms of pregnancy and if it is lactating then. And of course, there is differences in terms of geriatric patient and a pediatric patient. Uh, that will be discussed later on. At the same time, for geriatric patient, may have limitations then in terms of its physiological function then. So it, they may have renal or hepatic failure. Now, moving on to this, prescription analysis is also related then to counseling. Because what we have analyzed at the very beginning when we actually received the prescription, we'll be able to ask pertinent questions to our client. Like, for example, uh, is the patient actually capable in using with a certain device for an inhaler? Or did the patient actually know how to use suppository or how to use with the medication? Is the patient actually smoking or drinking coffee or drinking alcohol or other medications then? So it is important to counsel patient based on what we have analyzed then. So this is step number three. And this step number three is very important for all of us as pharmacists because oftentimes we can see in the community or in the hospital setting that, no, that few pharmacists only are adapting to counsel with their patient. They just receive the money, give the medication to your client, and give also the cambio or the, ex uh, the exchange of the money. Now, it is important for all of us to take note how busy our daily routine as a pharmacist, we be able to actually ask our patient, motivate our patient, and become a public health pharmacist by trying to counsel them in terms of smoking cessation, lessing salt, the lasting uh, intake of fats no, and other lifestyle modifications. And of course, some inquiries and concern for our patient. Referral is a must then when we look at this. When it, if this is an interrelated and interprofessional way of referring our client no, to the healthcare, other healthcare professional. And that is referral then to the doctors, to the medical technologies, to the physical therapies and others no, in terms of other medical conditions. Okay? That is why it's very important okay, to work collaboratively. Now, there are three checks and seven rights that we need to actually take note that the first check that we have is a check in terms of our container label before taking the container from the shelf. Aside from that, to be second check for our container label against the prescription during the actual dispensing. At the same time also, another check in putting the container away from away. So in that case, we'll be able to actually promote patient safety to our clients. At the same time, we'll be able to adopt the seven rights, which is right to date. Write the patient, write dose, write dose, write drug, write route, write frequency, and of course, the right container or the right label. Okay? So this is very important for all of us to take note with these seven rights. And if you have any questions, you can post it in our chat box or you can actually put it in our YouTube channel for further questions so that I'm able to address your questions. Now, we're going to move on to the geriatric patient as part of our part number one for prescription analysis. Because prescription analysis is very broad. No? So one of it would be in terms of the geriatric patient. Now, as we all know, in the geriatric patient, for elderly patient, we'll be able to prescribe for medical doctors appropriately to, the medic, to our geriatric patient. And we'll be able to dispense medication and scrutinize the prescription. Is it really appropriate to give Alaxan in the, for, our, for the headache, paracetamol for the, 
for the rayuma, another pain reliever then for the muscle ache and all, which is all of it is actually pain reliever. You can give only one, perhaps, as one of the appropriate for it. But is it really a need? Is it really a need then? So that's the major question. Now, there are some patients that have multiple drugs, polypharmacy, with multiple diseases or polymorbidities or mortality of a certain patient. We'll be able to ask ourselves and we'll be able to scrutinize the prescription that is it really a need then? Because high probability, if it is more than one, two drugs, three drugs, or four drugs, it may have a lot of drug interactions. So we'll be able to take note, pag dalawa na yung medication sa isang prescription, hala, it may actually be high probability of 80 to 90% that it may have a high chances of drug-drug interaction or drug-herbal interaction. So you'll be able to scrutinize also the patient that, ma'am, have you taken other medication like herbal supplements, like, for example, a hormonal replacement, contraceptive, if, the, if that would be for, uh, for patient who is going to be stopping pregnancy, ano? baka they're taking up contraceptives and all. So we'll be able to ask our patient. Okay? And in the form of medicine, there are some patients, especially old patients, may have a problem in terms of swallowing. And that, are, that, are, that particular problem that we need to address it and we'll be able to talk to our prescriber that it may be changed into a liquid preparation then. So it's very important that that is not just a matter of difficulty of swallowing or dexterity wherein they may have difficulty in terms of uh, you know, handling the certain medication because they may have difficulty. Nagkurog ang ilahang kamot. So these are some concerns. And we need really to address this with our prescribers. Okay? So collaboratively, you'll be able to talk with your prescriber. Now, next would be the manifestation of aging. Now, in the manifestation of aging, we'll be able to actually look that our patients are really declining or deteriorating in terms of their physiological psychological, in a cognitive way, they may have really difficulties later on. And specifically also for patients having Alzheimer's, dementia, no, having Parkinson, may have a lot of uh, this kind of inconveniences to our patient. So this really affects in terms of their aging. And usually those pain relie relievers like, for example, your ibuprofen, paracetamol, NSAIDs, may actually cause also neurological effects later on. In the long run, according to studies, it may actually cause a lot of neurological effects to our certain patient. That is why we need to give appropriate medications to our certain clients. Next one would be in terms of sensitivity. Because there are certain cases wherein a patient may have sensitivity for common drugs like analgesics that may cause stomach upset. At the same time also, not only with that, but it may also cause neurological effects later on or cognitive effects later on. Now, in the pharmacokinetic, because as what mentioned a while ago, that it may have certain physiological effects, deteriorating physiological effects. They may have poor renal failure, poor renal clearance, and it really affects in terms of the elimination of a drug. Some of it may be reabsorbed into the body, and it may cause toxic effect then on the blood serum concentration of our certain client, meaning Sa Bisaya pa na siya, mutaas ang level sa imuhang medication sa blood niya, ang iyahang concentration niya because it was not been eliminated in the body. 
So that is really the effect of the poor renal clearance. And this avail with that, that the poor, uh, poor absorption and metabolism of the drug may also be affecting because of the deterioration in the body organs. At the same time also, there are certain really side effects associated with some medications. And sometimes we need to stop this kind of medication, especially hypnotics, diuretics, NSAID, and etc. That may really affect a lot of adverse reaction, like for example, diuretic. Uh, it may cause actually more often urination for our client, for our patient. That tunga sa gabi eh, kung gihatag ni mo na siya sa imong pasyente, it may cause a lot of sleeping disturbance to your client. So problema kayo na, maybe sa imo as a pharmacist, dili na siya problema, but problema na sa imong client, sa imong pasyente, because ikaw daw, mumata alas do sa buntag just to urinate. And it really disturbed the normal cycle of sleeping of your client. At the same time, there are different classes of medication that are oftenly very, it will really cause a lot of side effects. And mainly warfarin, bleeding, insulin, oral antiplatelets, oral antihyperglycemics that are really aggravating conditions because of side effects to our clients. Okay? So... You'll be able to take care for your geriatric patient. And we will start that one to your loved ones, which are your lolo and lola, at the same time, your parents. Now, there are different methods that we can actually use so that we'll be able to analyze prescription correctly. And one of it is actually the BEARS criteria for potentially inappropriate medications. The stop-start tool the good palliative geriatric practice algorithm and the non-pharmacological measure that are appropriate then in terms of little side effect, but then we'll be able to remedy it with a non-pharmacological like massage, no, oil, lavender oil, no, and etc. for sleeping, for insomnia, headache, sleeplessness, and others that doesn't necessarily can be cured or treated with certain medications. It can be done using non-pharmacological measures. Now, moving on with this, I think this is a very obvious slide that there are really increasing state of what had happened to our geriatric patient, especially physiological, that will affect later on with pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamic we were in, what the drug actually receptive to the body and the body to the drug, wherein it really affects the Ladmer system or the ADME system, the absorption, distribution, excretion, and metabolism of a drug. That we all know that they may be very susceptible to a lot of polypharmacy, drug interactions, adverse drug reaction, and prescribing cascade them or poor compliance or inappropriate in terms of prescribing pattern for our certain uh, patient. For how many years in terms of practice as a pharmacist, I do believe that a geriatric patient really need to have a good uh, touch, a good interaction with our client. They will often go to you if they love you. And if they want to share experiences with you or share what they happen to you. So it's a matter of your smile. It's a matter of your approach. It's a matter of how you deal with them. Sometimes we don't understand our Lolo and Lola. Why is it that they're going to pee, poo, -poo no? Uh, involuntary peristalsis, uh, involuntary urination. Sometimes we are disturbed of all those things. We don't understand them. For geriatric pharmacists are specialized for this. We be able to look the condition of our client. We be able to look holistically of what is going on then for our patient. That is how we manage. It's not only end up of counseling with them, but monitoring. Nay, kumusta na kanay? Kumusta na balita? Kumusta na mo apo? Ana, so mga kumusta? 
Okay? A simple kumusta really touch them in one way or the other. Okay? Like one of my patients is actually experiencing hypertension because she actually told me during our counseling that she actually experienced a lot of stress at home because nangutang pa siya, sa iyang pension, because ang iyang anak, no, daghan ka ayong problema, problema sa pamilya. And she is really affected of it. That's why her BP actually shoot up no, into 150 over 100, no, 120. So it really unstable and it really actually becomes uh, an insomnia for her no, at that time. So dili lang sa ingon na mangumusta ka about the tambal, mangumusta po ka, ma'am, kumusta na? Kumusta ni mo apo, ma'am? And they'll be able to share to you that that's really the reason why is it that they have the such condition of the patient. Now we move on to the beers criteria. And the beers criteria actually is a compendium of a lot of inappropriate medications. And these are potential that we need to avoid as a pharmacist, as a healthcare professional, according to the American Geriatric Society then. And this is really a guidance for all of us, clinicians like you, Ms. Mundas, Ms. Octavio, and Ms. Miguel, that you be able to stop medications which are inappropriate then and you'll be able to recommend a good plan therapeutic plan for a certain geriatric patient i think the doctors would love it and the doctors would really uh, commend your effort as a pharmacist dili lang tong murakig na maligya lang you'll be able to call the physician you'll be able to uh, doc is it uh, recommended for this can we stop this medication because it may cause a lot of side effect later on for our geriatric patient. It may cause fall to our patient. It may cause a lot of risk to our client. So these are a lot of possibilities that we can actually look into. Now, it can start with you. You can, you can start at home looking at the medication of your Lolo and Lola. Maybe there's commonalities of this medication like, for example, aspirin that usually prevent for cardiovascular disease and colorectal cancer, but oftentimes they may actually cause a lot of risk of major bleeding. Aside from that, like the Bigatran, uh, Rivaro, Saban, it may actually increase the risk of gastrointestinal bleeding that aggravate the condition of your geriatric patient. Wala siya namatay because of the diabetic na they suffered but namatay mo pasyente because of what? Gastrointestinal bleeding. So it's very ironic, right? So you'll be able to stop medication which are not actually good to your client or to your patient. Okay? Aside from that, there are some hospice, clinics, or even small hospitals or centers that actually stop already this line of medication. Example, diphenhydramine, hydroxine, promethazine, no? which may actually have an indication for insomnia, itchiness, but they have a lot of concerns in terms of cognitive impairment and they are very highly anticholinergic. Magreklamo ang tigula, dry daw kayang mata, dry ka ayaw hang baba, no? dryness as one of it. 3D in our pharmacology, right? 3D, diarrhea, dryness, right? And of course, other 3Ds. So we'll be able to look at this because these are very serious uh, signs and symptoms then of uh, anticholinergic agents and cognitive impairment. Makalimut na, makalimut sa yung apo, makalimut sa pag toothbrush, makalimut sa pagligo, and other daily routines of our geriatric patient. Now, we be able to understand also that benzodiazepine may also cause a lot of risk of fall, for falls, sleepless impairment, antipsychotic agent may cause uh, increased risk of mortality and morbidity, na gusto na mamatay ato ang client. At the same time, for opioid and non-opioid medication for pain may actually cause also for cognitive impairment, constipation. This is serious effect 
for geriatric patient, anong sige man siya ka nang ka-constipate na ay tungod eh, kaya sa paracetamol na iyang gitake. Because it may cause constipation and the risk of fall. Okay, there was a one incidence as what mentioned in your dispensing number one that a patient was actually found out in the garden because nagmura siya nag nag uh, nag nag what automatic naman ang pagkuan sa ilang grass no grass cutter she actually immediately fall in the next morning she was found out that she was bitten with a lot of insect because hindi naman siya makakuha makatindo and found out by the neighbor so that is simple example but it really aggravate the condition of your client next one is a stop and start tool so this is very important because we'll be able to stop and start a particular medication which are potentially inappropriate for a certain uh, patient and potential for prescribing omission then or reduction of a certain medication for your client. Okay? So wala takabalo, di prescribe siya o certain paracetamol until matingala ka, si, si ma'am or si sir, ang lolo o lola, sige diya po siya inom o paracetamol, mas kibili siya needed. So what had happened? It may cause gastric ulcer or irritation in terms of hepatic injury to the certain patient. Okay? Kaya wala ba ka nag-ingon din na, wala may pharmacist nag-ingon na, you be, better take paracetamol only when needed. So it's very important that we be able to counsel our client and analyze the prescription if it is needed or not for a certain client. So there's a lot of examples for stop and st uh, start and stop tool, which is one of the examples would be, as what mentioned in your dispensing number one, a loop diuret uh, thiocyte diuretic with a history of a gout because it may increase in terms of the uric acid into the body, into the plus, into the into the blood. So what would happen if thiocyte diuretic is given for a gout patient? It may increase in terms of the gout because it increases also the tendency or the availability of the uric acid in the blood. So it's very important to take note to stop this particular medication. Now, these are some of the examples as what mentioned a while ago. And another example that you can actually take note in terms of starting and stopping a certain appropriate and inappropriate medications. Now, it's very important to take note that how do we manage polypharmacy and in relation to the prescription analysis, we'll be able to start that, number one, is it really actually will cause drug interaction to our patient? If it causes drug interaction, then we'll be able to replace, substitute, or omit the certain, uh, the certain uh, medication. Or it, if there is a lesser drug interaction, there will be an interval then of maybe three to six hours before the said medication. Another one would be in terms of timing. Okay, we'll be able to have interval then in terms of other medication. Number three would be in terms of duplication, like they're taking up multivitamins. Napundun siya vitamin B+. Napundun siya vitamin C. Napundun siya vitamin D and a lot of vitamins then. Napundun siya herbal supplements para sa yung arthritis. So, daghan kayo siyang tambal. Daghan kayo siyang tambal. So, this is what we called as polypharmacy. We can be able to combine all this into one. And that is your multivitamins. Okay? And of course, other strategies that to be able to manage certain polypharmacy. So, sir, grabi ba juning polypharmacy? Yes. You'll be able to see in your lola and lolo in your houses, unsay mga tambal nila. And you will say, nagreklamo si patient A, na sakit yung ulo, another reseta. Nag, re, nagkwa na po siya, another na po, reseta na po. Other reseta, reseta, reseta. So in that case, you'll be able to manage this and reduce in terms of the medication taken by a certain uh, patient. Now, moving on to this, there are suggested 
in terms of administration of selected uh, medication. And one of it, uh, in terms of dosing schedules, is your antihypertensive medication that should be taken in the morning. Lipid-lowering agent will be the evening because that is a time for the metabolism of certain lipids. No? And of course, the sex hormone will be in the morning. Antiplatelets will be in the morning. Sedating agents will be in the evening. And diuretic should be in the morning because if diuretic is taken in the evening, so mag -ihi -ihi na siya. But if it is actually taken twice in a day, it should be three to five hours before the said sleeping time of a certain patient. So you need to look at the C-max. You look at the plasma level then. Kung kanus ba siya mo down? No? Kanus ba ang peak sa imong certain medication? So that ma-advise ni mo ang patient ni mo na, Ma'am, kailangan ni mo na mo take any medication five hours before the said, uh, before your sleep. Because five hours is a time wherein the drug will be able to be eliminated in the body. Okay? So dapat you be able to be familiarized with your pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Now, there are some drugs that we move on to the prescribing, de-prescribing. What do you mean by de-prescribing? That is actually omission, elimination of a particular drug for a certain geriatric patient like benzodiazepines, antipsychotic agents, and a lot of polypharmacy due to herbal medications and non-prescription drugs like OTC medications that may cause a lot of drug interaction to our certain client then, okay? And we always say there's a lot of complaints. Reklamador, kaayo nga itong mga tigulang. Sakit pagtuhod, sakit anti-ill, incontinence, hearing impairment, makatawa na lang ka. But that's true for our patient. Because for geriatric patient, normally in the physiological aspect, there is degradation. Okay? There's declining physiological function of the body. So makita ni mo, di sila katulog, insomnia, dizziness, vision impairment, especially with diabetic patients because it will dry the eyes and it will have a lot of impairment in the vision. Okay? And other uh, cognitive effects to the patient. Now, this is an algorithm. I'm sure it's quite a little uh, very minute as you can see. This is actually an algorithm wherein you will say that is it appropriate or not? If it is inappropriate, then you will proceed to the next. Is it, uh, is it appropriate then to give the medication? Next, next, and next. Until you will derive that is it going to be eliminated? Is it going to stop? Is it going to continue? So this is an algorithm then for you to actually follow. A cascade for all of us to remember that the drug is appropriate or not. Now, there are a lot of considerations then based on our prescription analysis. And one of it is actually to identify the drug interaction and adverse reactions. Okay? We need to have a clear explanation. Like, for example, patient having tuberculosis then, taking up rifampicin. So, uh, one of the side effects of rifampicin is that uh, discoloration of uh, orange coloration in the urine. So that will actually say that, ma'am, uh, please take note that your urine will become uh, orange. And that is normal for the certain medication. Don't be shocked. That is normal that your urine will become orange. So there will be clear explanation there. At the same time also, you need to consider that if it is appropriate or not. Or perhaps you need to change the medication into another dosage form because uh, this medication, this patient may have difficulty in terms of swallowing. Or a certain geriatric patient taking up, like for example, anti-diabetic medication that is enteric coated. So enteric coated is intended then for a site wherein it will be absorbed. And that is not for the stomach to be absorbed. But then it is in the small intestine. 
So do not crush the medication which are modified release or controlled release tablet because it is intended on a particular side of absorption. And of course, this must not be modified. Okay, this must not be modified. Or you need to actually appropriately tell the patient if it is in a full glass of water or uh, it should not be taken up with grapefruit juice or another certain beverages that may have an interaction on drug food interaction. And you'll be able to consider also advising with the caregivers and also other healthcare professionals. Now, there are a lot of guidelines then for geriatric patients. And one of it that we need to be able to analyze that we be able to have a safe and effective uh, treatment to our elderly patient because we need to set the limit. The limitations are based on their body weight. Limitations will be based on the kidney functions, liver functions, and others. Okay? And we be able to reduce the dose 50% of the adult dose. At the same time, we be able to review regularly, maybe after an initial dose. We be able to actually tell our patient, sir, you be able to visit your physician after this medication for this week, for one week. After one week, you be able to go to your physician on the this following day. Okay? Because they may take in, taking the drugs initially. But if that would be in terms of maintenance, to be able to review regularly, okay, na mga yung pasyente that complaining of dizziness, na hypo na day sila, na sobraan na sa tambal, or may have other certain condition there. At the same time, simplify. Ayo palisud disura ang tigulang. You'll be able to actually simplify in terms of their dosage, in terms of dosage form, and other intervals. Instead of three times a day, you may be able to have a drug which are higher in terms of a dose that needed to be taken only once or twice in a day. At the same time, you'll be able to write the full instruction clearly and we'll be able to ask the patient, Sir, nakasabot ba ka, sir? Sir, can you repeat what I have mentioned to you? Okay, para masabtan dyan. Or ang young caregiver na nagbantay sa iyaha. You'll be able to repeat and you'll be able to tell if there are need to be disposed, especially liquid medication or a tablet medication. Okay? And for calculation purposes, we always say that the physiological characteristic of a geriatric patient identifies why we need to compute. And the computations are basically on the kidney clearance, the function of the kidney and the liver, at the same time, other factors. Like, for example, the body weight of the patient because pagkatigulang, uh, the body muscles or the body mass actually decreases. Okay? So you'll be able to identify also creatinine clearance then for kidney function. Now, thank you very much for that. I think that's the last slide for, uh, for all of us. And I hope and I pray that you'll be able to actually digest what we have learned in this particular slide. Thank you very much.